Decision making. This is the topic that we'll be covering today and Lord willing next, next week. You know, when you move around the coast of the soul, especially in this town, what do people want to come here for? The sun, uh, the good environment in the street, the easy going type of life. I bet you nobody comes here thinking, well, as soon as I get there, I'm going to die. They're living, they want to live it up, and if they have some savings, and they've made their investments right, they might be there at the age of 65, 67, thinking, well, you know, uh, now I can relax and enjoy the rest of my life. That's what the passage that we have actually open and deals, uh, it's all about. Now, what, what I'm going to be talking about in the next, uh, today and next week, is about making godly decisions. Uh, for your life. Godly decisions for your life. And in order to make godly decisions for your life, you need to understand that your life doesn't end at 65, 67, and then you, you just retire. When you reach 65, 67, or 70, 71, whatever it is, you, you think, as a Christian, you think, Lord, uh, I'll be ready to retire when you take me to heaven. There's, if you have me here, you still have something for me to do. So every step of the way through life, all the way to the end, we will be, need to make decisions, but we need to have something in consideration. The last word is the Lord's word. The Lord is the one that gives you the last word. Now, <clears throat> far from being left alone in our decision, God invites us to join Him as He leads us. There are a good number of scriptures references uh, that indicate this very, very clearly. For example, Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 7, it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, so there he goes. And lean not on your own understanding. So what do we do with this list? Now this is not rubbish. This is good stuff. But again, the last word is the Lord's word. So when it comes to making plans, make sure that you include the Lord in every step of the way. Lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways, in all thy ways, acknowledge him. And he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And in Proverbs 15, 22, it says, Without counsel, uh, counsel purposes are dis dis uh, disappointed. But in the middle of counselors, they are established. Seek godly wisdom from other people. And when making decisions, don't ever forget Romans 14, 2. One day we will be before the Lord having to give an account. If you're saved, brother and sister in Christ, your life does not belong to you. Come on, give me an amen for that. Amen. If you're born again, you will bought with a price, and your life does not belong to you. Amen. So when it comes to making decisions, we need to have one thing in mind. One day, whatever decision we make, whatever we do, one day we'll have to stand before the Lord and do what it says here, so that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And we better not forget the Lord in any uh, area of our life. Now, we can discover how to make good decisions by making, uh, asking good questions. And I have some uh, questions here that you can ask in order to kind of Forward, the forward you. For example, does, uh, does it align with God's word? What does the Bible say about this decision? What, what I pretend to do? Does it align with God's word? Uh, so God will never ask you to do something that contradicts uh, His will, uh, the written will. In Second Timothy chapter three, verse sixteen through seventeen, it gives us a good a good idea of why the scriptures is important in our decision making. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might, may be perfect, thorough, pre thoroughly prepared, or furnished unto all good works. Whatever we are to do, whether, whether it's a work for a company, uh, retire here, or as we you know, kind of call it, retire here, in the cross of the soul, we're not here to just do nothing for the Lord. We are here to serve them. Amen? Mm -hmm. So, if you say, well, I have a dream. I have a desire. I really want to just come to the point where I don't have to give anybody an account. 
You'll never reach that point because as Christians, we need to give the Lord account. We're accountable. Second question you can ask, have I spent enough time praying about it? Sometimes we, we pray and we don't get an answer, then we make a decision and we jump into a situation. Sometimes well, the best thing you can do is just keep on praying until the Lord comes through. So have I spent enough time praying before making a decision? Always pray and ask God for his help. Uh, James 1, 5 through 8, it says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth all men liberally, and, uh, uh, um, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, uh, not wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of, uh, of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So you say, uh, I want to do the Lord's will, but then you really have second intentions. It's not going to work. And most of the time, uh, we, uh, <clears throat> we make a decision and they pray about it. It's always before. It's supposed to be before. First, our first instinct should be, Lord, what do you want me to do? The second, the third question you can ask, what do wise, godly people I know say about this? When you don't know what to do, we must seek advice from intelligent, holy people, a spiritual, healthy track record. What have, how have they made the decisions in the past? Uh, you need their, their, their wise counsel. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of the fool is right in his own eyes. But he that hearken unto counsel is wise. So listen to others. Listen to what they have to say. And if they're, like I said, they have a good track record, then it's much better. They know that they've been there before. And that experience is valuable. The next question, what is the wise thing to do? <clears throat> uh, ask wisdom to the Lord. In Ephesians 5, 5 uh, 15 through 17 it says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Here it is, redeeming the time. I'm 67. I remember being a kid when I, my dad turned 67. I said, wow, he's turning so old. In a few months, it'll be 68. And it'll go on and on. Just the other day, I was talking to my dad. sister. I wonder what the Lord has for us in the future. And she said, well, if it's in his will, it'll be good. No matter what the situation is. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Sometimes you need to go a little deeper. And you might want to take a few days of fasting. And the last question, what would be most honoring to God? Not what, what's most profitable to me. What makes my life easier, but... What would, man, what, is the, uh, what would be most honoring to God? And here we have 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. It says, I will honor those who honor me. Now, I ask you to turn to Luke chapter 12. You might be very familiar with this story. It's about the story of a farmer, a man who owned a large uh, piece of land. Almost more, it looked more like a province than a, just a farm. Uh, I don't know if you've ever... Uh, seen any documentaries on Montana. Uh, you get a horse, you try to uh, ride through the ranch, and it might take you two or three days. Those ranches over there are like countries. Um, and this is the idea that we find here in Luke chapter 12. So I invite you to come with me to Luke chapter 12, and I want you to see this man's uh, process of making decisions. We start reading in verse 13, and he says, And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And boy, it's time to make plans, right? 
things, life is good. My investments have been good. My work has produced a tremendous amount of gain. <clears throat> and look what it says in verse 17. And he thought with himself, this is the problem. He consulted with himself. What do I want? And he said, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. This is what I'm going to do. It's a good plan. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. What's this verse full of? I, 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 me, myself, and I. It wasn't that what made the devil fall? Wasn't that what made Nebuchadnezzar fall? Look at the how much I built. Look at the it's me, 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 me in the center of the situation. So he's got plans. They seem to be very good plans. And Lord noted verse 19. And I will say to my soul, like if he was the owner and the ultimate leader, uh, of what's going to happen? Or the one that would have the say so with what's going to happen with his soul. And I will say to myself, So thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take, th take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. It's almost like you're saying, I want to go to the coast of the soul and retire. I just want to live it up. I've had enough. I've worked hard. Look, uh, it's been a success. And I just. And the solution is just to tear down the old barns, make them bigger so that I can store all that I have. I have a very healthy bank account. Uh, life is good. Now just enjoy it. But notice in verse 20, a very, very short word. What does it start with? But. But, <laughs> but God. Now, what God has to say about that is very important. It says, but God said unto him, thou fool. It's not going to be next week, it's not going to be next month, but this same night, this night, thy soul shall be required of thee, then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. Now, let's look at this very shortly. I don't plan to make a long story, a long message out of this, but I want to extract from this several things that I think will help us in our decision making. Notice that we need to include God in everything, that He is the ultimate one. Uh, we have some young uh, folks here, we have some older ones. Uh, don't think you're in charge of your life. Don't think that you, can, you have the last word in anything. What we see in this passage is several things. First of all, we need to understand that, yeah, we can enjoy life, but always have the Lord included in every decision. It's not what I'm, it's not what I'm going to get out of it, it's what does the Lord want me to do? This man has it all planned out. I'm going to enjoy life. And I have, and I have uh, my schedule already laid out for me. I'm going to just eat. Today I'm going to be in the and this restaurant, and that tomorrow I'm going to have a, a wonderful feast over there. It almost sounds like uh, Luke's uh, uh, 16, doesn't it? That rich man in Lazarus didn't think of, any, of anything except just enjoying <coughs> life. I work hard to have a future. And now the future is here. This is my future. Uh, eat, drink, and be merry. Just be happy. Who doesn't want that? I would say that just about everybody in the planet would think that this is a good plan. We work hard to have a good retirement or a good ending. I would just want to enjoy life. But then the Lord comes in and notice what he calls him again, you fool. You you empty headed, you nincompoop. Maybe he didn't say that, but you know, I kind of feel that it fits in. So Jesus asks him the question. Notice the, the context. And Jesus is giving a, a wonderful speech there in chapter 12, verse 1. It says, and in the uh, in the in the meantime, when they were gathered together and in uh, a numerable multitude of people, insomuch that they uh, trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, First of all, beware ye of the leaven. And then, so he has uh, 
whole chapter here, it's all in my Bible we have, which has red letters. It's all some, you know, a, a good instruction that Jesus wants to give, give his disciples and the people that are surrounding him. And in the middle of this, two of his disciples come and say, we have a problem. And Jesus asks a question. If you look, look with me, in verse 14 it says, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Uh, who's made me um, um, to, uh, to decide over your real estate? I'm not here to decide over your real estate. I'm not here for that. And, of course, we see that there's a quarrel. Uh, these, these two brothers were thinking, well, it's his fault. He's got the problem. And the other guy was thinking, no, 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 I don't have the problem. You have the problem. It's always the other guy that has the problem, right? I, I, was, read, I was reading a, um, a note from Vance Hadner who tells the story of a man who went to a psychiatrist, a psychiatrist with a fried egg on top of his head and a strip of bacon hanging from each ear. And he went to the psychiatrist and said, Sir, I come here to talk about my brother. He's got a problem. <laughs> it's always somebody else who's giving us the problems. And here like, they're coming to the Lord Jesus Christ with this. And so the Lord asks the question, who do you think made, has made me a judge or a divider over you? Uh, God has not come to make me, I have not come here to, make, uh, to be a financial planner for you. I have not come to settle a state, the state of the people, to, uh, 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 the, situ the financial state of the, situ of the people. And then we see Jesus issues a warning. Look, look, look at the warning in verse 15. And he said unto them, Take heed, and he adds more to that, and beware of covetousness. When you have these two words together, the Lord is trying to catch our attention. Well, those two words are like two flashing signs in front of a bridge that says, No bridge ahead. Take heed is a word of caution. An, ex an, an exhortation, a warning. And then you have the next word, beware. It's like, look out, you're in danger. And then he tells them the problem. Jesus said, this of covetousness, which means uh, an inordinate desire for more. It is a picture of people who are, who are never satisfied with their situation. They always want more. They just seem to be driven by greed. So Jesus said, beware, take heed of greed, of covetousness, of a desire for more. This is the warning. And when we look at this, think about how we uh, tend to make plans. You, it, it's a good thing to plan ahead and hopefully to make your life a little easier. I want to make this investment. So that it brings me a good gain, and then hopefully in the future I'll be able to live on that uh, on that gain and have life uh, easier for me. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but believe me, when you're a Christian, we're not here just for pleasure. We're here to serve. Amen. We are here to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And in order to have them understand, notice the third thing: Jesus speaks a parable in verses 16 through 21. So the interrupter needed to realize that his was not a legal problem, but a spiritual one. You know, possessions are neither, they're not moral, they're neither uh, moral or immoral. Uh, it is impossible for an automobile or a television set or a bank account to be immoral. People are immoral. And it's our attitude about things that can make us moral or immoral. So in this parable, Jesus posits some very important truths. Two that I want to stake out. First of all, the deceptiveness of life. Did you notice that you can have plans and that's not going to interrupt death to come? You say, Lord, I, I, I don't have time to die. I have I've made up my plans. I've got my my life all scheduled out. Uh, I uh, I have people to see, places to go, things to do. I don't have time to die. Most people out there don't think that maybe tomorrow will be the last day. Just the other day, I heard of a a very famous football player who went to uh, to the field 
uh, hoping to win the, the, the match, and he dropped dead. A perfectly healthy athlete who trains every day, thought he would never die, and then his heart stopped. They never were able to recover him. He never went to the field thinking, I'm going to die today. He, I had, he had plans. He had plans to have enjoy a, a wonderful future. So, you know, sometimes we can deceive ourselves with this. We can say, you know, I, I know the Lord wants me to serve Him. I know the Lord wants me to, uh, to uh, um, surrender my life to Him and serve Him, but not today, Lord. I have my plans for today. I have my plans for tomorrow. By the way, I have my plans for the next 10 years. Maybe, maybe I'll find some time next year. Maybe, Lord, I'll be, I'll be there for you next year. Sometimes we think this way. I want to tell you that life is not made up or hold together or consist of the abundance of the things a person can collect. In verse 16, I found an interesting word. The word ground, I looked it up, and it translates choda from the, verse, uh, from the word choda, meaning a region or a country. Uh, this helps us understand that how vast the wealth this man uh, had uh, reached. His possessions reached far beyond the eyes could see. Uh, he could just sit on the balcony or the, the porch of his house, look out and say, life is good and I need to make some plans. I, may, I might just bring in the best consultants, the best uh, business um, counselors. I might just bring some of the uh, guys that know how to multiply gain, how to multiply riches. I think I have this under control. He looked at his possession, he looked at, uh, his, uh, at, his, at his land, and he thought he had lordship over his own things. It was almost like having a little province. Um, he had a great deal of ground, and his ground was very, very fruitful. I can just imagine him looking at his wealth, thinking, now I can live the dream. A lot of people are going to the United States thinking about the American dream. And you know what's happening? It's becoming the American nightmare. Some people come to Europe for the same thing, for the same, with the same look, for the same uh, 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 desire, for the same, how do you say, uh, 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 interest. Ambition. Ambition, thank you very much. And sometimes we come to a place like this. Praise the Lord for Andalusia. Praise the Lord for a place like Ben on Mother, the Costa del Sol. But you know, after six months living in the Costa del Sol, all that glow that the coast offers, if you're a Christian, disappears. I once had brother, brother Woody, and Gilbert Wood, Dr. Gilbert Wood, he came for the first time and I drove him up the hill all, and I showed him around in Fuenquirola and Malaga and so on. As we were coming down into Ben on Mother, he looked at the beautiful city of Ben Omadana and then the coast, and he said, oh, I'm not surprised that so many people in Europe want to come and retire here. You're very fortunate to live here. And I looked at him and I said, you know, when I came here, I thought, wow, beautiful, what a great place to, to be. Uh, and then six months later, I realized that there's a lot of hurting people in, in Arroyo. People who have, uh, yes, they might have invested and come up with riches, maybe wonderful apartment, maybe several apartments that bring in great gain, and at the end of the day, they look out their window thinking, now what? This is not giving me the satisfaction I was hoping to have. I was hoping to, do, to live the dream, but I was hoping that maybe when I retire, I'd be able to just go fishing. You know, how much fishing can you do when you retire? And then get tired of it. Maybe you can just laze away and enjoy life. He doesn't seem to have any worry about his future and feels like he doesn't have to give account to anybody. <clears throat> He's his own boss. And he figures that he has control over his life and his wealth and he can just live it out. And then verse 20, it breaks the whole story, uh, just bursts this whole story to nothing but God. You know, it's a, there's a lesson here that we need to understand, and that is the deceptiveness of life. We are not 
in control. It is interesting, you know, uh, some young kids in my block, when they come down the elevator, they think, oh, look at this guy now. He used to have hair, and now it's all gray, and he's losing his hair. But look at us, we're nice. And, and you know, then one, one of those young kids, 17 year old, was uh, run down by a car, died in the middle of the, uh, right in front of the train station. He thought he had his life all, you know, uh, just laid out before him. You know, life can deceive you because it might make you think that you are in control of it. And then another thing, the determination of death. Three things that we need to consider here. First of all, death cannot be de deterred by our problems and by our plans. In verse 17, this man had plans. I don't have time to die. I am ready to live. And I had my plans already set out, but he never thought that from heaven he would receive this word, you fool. This is the end for you. This man had a problem. He needed bigger barns to store his good. He doesn't have time to die. Death is not in his agenda. It is not in his plans. And God is not in his plans either. In Ephesians 5, 14 through 17, he said, Wherefore, he said, Wait, awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you the light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. You know what I want to add to this is this. No matter what age you are, and you know, whether it's 18, 16, 20, 67 like me, 71, this morning we had Brother Juan here. He lost his wife just a few months ago. Juan, uh, uh, Remedios Juan, you know what I'm, what I'm talking about. And I, and I asked him, Juan, you've, you've uh, I think he's 85, something like that. He's pretty old. 87. 87. I said, how do you feel? He said, give me some tracks. I want to go out there and pass them out. This is what, this is what keeps me going during the week. It is looking to the Lord and saying, Lord, if you give me one more day, I want to live it for you to glorify you. And this is keeping him going. One of his delights, now that he's alone, is coming to the church and finding a Christian family here. And having people that would come and, and, and hug him and say, Juan, you're not alone in this. God is not finished with you, so then stay active. Give God an excuse to keep you alive. Serve him. So death cannot be determined by our problems, and then death cannot be deterred by our plenty. If I said, if I gave you the name James, I'm sorry, Sam Walton, did that ring a bell? You know it? Good friend of mine. A good friend of yours. But if I said Walmart, that would ring a bell, at least for some of you. He became uh, America, America's most, uh, the richest uh, man from 1982 to 1988. He didn't become a millionaire, he became a billionaire. And I looked him up, uh, it says Walton was included in Times list for 100 most influential people of the 20 uh, 20th century. Walton was honored for his work in uh, retail in March 1992, just one month before his death, when he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom uh, from the President George H. W. Bush. Forbes ranked Sam Walton as the richest man in the United States from 1982 to 1988, ceding the top spot to John Cruge. In 1989, when the editors, uh, uh, when the editors began to credit Walter's fortune jointly to him and his four children, Bill Gates first headed the list in 1992 with uh, the year Walton died. Uh, Walton uh, Walmart stores uh, are have been uh, planted in 15 different countries: Argentina, Brazil, Canada, Chile. China, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, India, South Africa. Did you ever come across the Walmart over there? 
Botswana, Ghana, Malawi, Mozambique, Namibia, Tanzania, Uganda, Zambia, Kenya, Lesotho. I didn't even know there was a country called Lesotho. <laughs> what uh, is Watini? That's a country, believe it or not. Honduras, Japan, Mexico, Nicaragua, Nicaragua, and of course the United States. This man planted uh, Walmart uh, uh, chain uh, <coughs> stores all over the world. Uh, I was looking for Spain, it doesn't show in Spain. But you know what happened to Sam Walton that's gonna happen to everybody? What he has in common with you and with me, he's, he died. And we are going to die. This is, I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm, telling, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this so that we will learn to count our time pr uh, to glorify the Lord. This, this man, uh, although I think he, he did well uh, with his investment because he gave a lot of jobs to many, many people, did not have time to die. Every morning he got up, probably thinking, where else can I, can I plant a Walmart store? Today we talk more about Bill Gates being one of the richest man, men. Jeff Bezos, you know who he is, he's become rich, one of the most richest men in the world. He's the owner of Amazon. And now we start hearing about Elon Musk. He's wanting to, he thinks about tomorrow. I want to plant a colony in Mars. I'm going to spend all my future, my fortune, to build this. And he's, you know, he's making huge amounts of money, investing in, all, in more investigation, trying to make people's lives a little easier. When you, when you talk about where is God in your plans, he doesn't have God in his plans. You know that Elon Musk, although he has wonderful plans, he died tomorrow. And you know he's going to have, he would have to come before the Lord and give account. <coughs> what did you do with your life? Well, Lord, I didn't have you in consideration. I thought I had control over my life and the life of many other people who work for me. Folks, we need to understand that death cannot be deterred by our plenty. Death will knock the door at the door and it will require us. And then third, death cannot be deterred by our plans, verse 18. Again, I want to put the cost of the soul as, as, a, as, a, as a scenario. It's a wonderful thing. By the way, let me say this before I say the next thing. When, we, when the Lord called us here down to Andalusia, we had no idea what Andalusia was about. It wasn't developed as much as it is right now. But when I met a missionary who worked in, uh, in uh, Fuenquirola, uh, Roy Lowe, he one day at, uh, over, over coffee, he said, Sammy, only very special people the Lord brings to this area. I said, you might be one of them. We are very privileged to live here. He lived first in Barcelona, a very crowded place full of smog and, and busyness, and then he came down here. But he said one thing, the Lord didn't bring me here to, on holiday. He came here, he sent me here for a purpose. And, I met, and my purpose is just everything here would darken if I did not serve the Lord in that purpose that he has for me. When he said that, I looked around, I didn't see close to the soul the same way. I started looking around at those houses, beautiful balconies, white washed uh, buildings, and I thought, I wonder what kind of people live in those houses. You know what kind of people live in those houses? Lost people. People who are struggling to make ends meet. People who might be going through diseases, illnesses, all kinds of pain. And you know, when you see the reality behind those windows, and then you look out and you say, this is just cosmetics. This is fake. If you're putting your hope in that, you will die very lonely and miserable. Alisa tells me of the people that she's had to visit. She was called by the police saying, you know, we have a case where uh, a family from so-and-so called, uh, call, you're talking about, uh, who want to know about their mother or their father who retired here a few years ago. They bought a wonderful villa and they moved here just to live the, few, the last few days of their life in this wonderful area called the Costa, called the Costa del Sol. And she said, when we went, we had to break the door down. We found both of them dried up six, I mean, eight months before. They died alone. Magnets were all dried up in the walls. There wasn't even odor anymore. 
They'd be, and she said, she looked at that and said, they never planned for this. They didn't even have somebody there to be beside them in that situation. When she comes home with these stories, you know, it just makes me sit back in the couch and say, Sammy, you better have your story right. Because you can be the next one. I would not like to hear from the Lord these words, thou fool, coming from the Lord, this is severe. This man said, I've got this, I'm going to live it up. He was expecting a wonderful future, expecting fun, a lot of luxury. Never was he expecting a voice from the Lord saying, it's the end. Decisions, they're hard to make. But I hope each one of us not just come to an area like this or any other area thinking, I just want to have a good life. I just want to make it as easy as possible for me and for my family. I hope that whatever decision we make is, Lord, what do you want me to do? If it's in this church, stay busy. Stay committed. Serve the Lord. Use your spare time to reach out to people. When you do this, your life will start becoming interesting. When you don't do this, all you can do is look out the window thinking, what's going to happen tomorrow? Just another, another paseo, another restaurant? Meet with my friends again? What, what, you know, I don't know. Those things, again, I'm not complaining about those things, but those things are nice. But it's more than just enjoyment. We're here for a purpose. When you look at the patriarchs in the Old Testament, you see that all of them had to make decisions. Some of them were very wise decisions, and some of them were very foolish. Joseph decided to remain pure rather than yield to the lust, uh, to lust, Genesis 39. Joshua decided to serve the Lord instead of false gods, Joshua chapter 24. Ruth decided to leave Moab and become a Jew and serve the Lord there. Daniel decided to pray rather than to fear the lions then, Daniel chapter 6. And the apostles decided to preach rather than to keep quiet. You shut up or we'll get you. We are in control of this. And the, 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 um, um, los ancianos, the, the elders of the city. And they said it's better to fear the Lord and it's better to, uh, to obey the Lord than it is to obey man. We tell you folks, it is better to, to serve the Lord than anything else in life. My life, really, I came to an awakening moment years ago. I think I've given you the story. I'm starting to sound like Brother Eddie. He repeats the stories again and again. I think I told you this, but I'm going to tell you again because it fits perfectly. I was about 26 years old. I had been saved for one year. I was excited about my salvation. I wanted... It was something that really gave me motivation. It gave me purpose in life. It wasn't just good job, good house, good car, you know, and things like that. It was like there's something that transcends this. There's something about the future that God, you know, for me, it gave me perspective. And I remember the pastor, brother, Pastor Juli Velasquez saying, you know, we, we've gone to different areas of town, but we never went to this old, uh, old people's homes. Uh, up in the hill, it was a, it, it looked like a palace. This old people home was more like a resort, holiday resort than a old people's home. It was a luxury old people's home. And you walked in, you had a, a grand entrance. Everything was flashy and new. And then I walked through the carriage corridors. I looked at the lunch uh, lunch rooms and and the restrooms, and it was like, this is where I want to retire. I mean, this would be a dream come true. This is. I mean, if you come, if you end your days here, it would be wonderful. There's people, some old people, you know, sitting around. And the, the purpose was to go in there and try to share the gospel. We were given permission to share the gospel with, with the, the, the folks there. And at that time in my life, I was having some problems deciding what, what my next step would be. What, what do I want for my future? And of course, I had just like every 25-year-old boy or man, you know, I had my plans. Better, bigger, and uh, whatever, you know. But at that time, it's, it's, it was, I really believe it was the Lord just moving my head from all that grandeur, 
opened to a very dark passageway. It was kind of dark. Everything was flashy, but here this very long corridor. The lights somehow were not on. And I could just see a silhouette of a man sitting on a, on a chair with his hands, with his head between his hands like this. And something drove me to go over there. And when I approached this man, I said, sir, are you all right? He kind of looked up. <sighs> sir, are you, are you all right, sir? Can I help you? I said, sir, I, 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 give me a few minutes. I, I came uh, today to talk to you about life. <laughs> 25-year-old boy, you know, 80-something-year-old 80 man in a luxury place like that, and he said, Life! Let me tell you what life is about, young man. You know, shaking that point, he said, I've worked hard all my life, and I succeeded. I wanted to give my boy and my children the best I could, and I gave them the best house I could buy. I gave him, uh, I helped them with, the, with their career, and they got, all of them are either lawyers or doctors, that, and you know, they succeeded in life too. And I even gave them the inheritance before death, so that they could have easier, their life easier than I did. Now look at me here, they don't even come to visit me. They forgot all about me. Son. Life is, and he gave me an adjective that I, could, I cannot repeat in this context. I was trembling. I turned around and said, sir, thank you very much. Have a good day. And then I went into a very lonely corridor and I started praying. Lord, that was the most powerful message I ever heard from a lost person. And it showed me that you can plan your life as well as you can and even succeed, but end up lonely, tired, and without purpose. Life, God made life so that it wouldn't make sense without Him. If you don't believe me, just read the book of Ecclesiastes. There's a man called Solomon. He had it all. All. I mean, all. And the description of life for him was everything is vanity of vanities and pain and sorrow under the sun. What am I trying to leave with you this afternoon? When you get up this afternoon and go home, think about this message. And next time you think about making plans, make sure that you make good plans. But make sure that God is included. Not just so that, Lord, bless my plans. No. Lord, what is your will for me? How can I serve you better? Let's stand and have a word of prayer. Mm -hmm. Dear Heavenly Father, we look at stories like this one and we begin to understand that what life is all about. You're the author of life. You're the one that gives meaning to life. You're the one that has control over our life. And you have plans for our life. And Lord, the best thing we could do is not just plan things out for our best, but plan things out for your will, according to your will. And so Lord, whether we are 18, 50, 67, or 78, 80 years old, doesn't matter. Our time still counts. Help us make wise decisions. Help us not just think, hey, I have a healthy bank account. I have a, a, an apartment that's all paid off. I can just live it out. But help us think more like, Lord, what do you want me to do? Right now, not tomorrow, but right now. What things need to change in my life? What priorities must I enhance? What things must I tear down because they don't glorify you? Help us, Lord, focus on you. So that one day when our life ends here, we can hear from you, good and wise and faithful servant. Well done. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.